Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. I am so excited for today's episode. I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Gabor Mate about his new book, The Myth of Normal. He has been such an influence on my own healing journey. Today, we talk about society and a mismatch between society and our individual developmental wants and needs, diving in to explore how so many of our mental illnesses, our physical symptoms are a result of that mismatch. Tune in. You don't want to miss this conversation. So as I was sharing with you before we got started, um, Dr. Gabor Mate here, I am so truly honored. Um, you've had such an impact in shaping the way that I think about a human being and tools that I've actually implemented on my own healing journey and now have began to implement and integrate into my practice. So I'm feeling so honored and so overjoyed and and really so appreciative of, of the role that you've played and really looking forward to for anyone of my community who hasn't yet heard of your work, um, though I'm sure many, many have. I'm really excited for them to be introduced to you um, and your ideas. And of course, your newest book, The Myth of Normal. So thank you for sharing your time and presence with me today. Well, thank you for your presence and your this platform that you're offering for, for me to talk about my work. Of course, of course. I think a, a really helpful place to start, um, especially acknowledging that very similar to my training, you've come through what I refer to as a traditional system, um, yeah. training as a you know a medical psychiatrist in contrast, of course, to my clinical. Sorry to interrupt. I was never trained as a psychiatrist, which is a good thing. Okay, I, w- I was a medical doctor for all those years, and so my I have a classical medical training, of which psychiatry formed a part. But I did not train as a psychiatrist. Well, tell me, what do you when you say it's a good thing? Um, I guess that's a really great place to start because I was leading into. I mean, what you really share is a big shift um, in understanding of us as what you call biopsychosocial beings, and really about us and our health and how much our genetics play a role. And of course, now as we're beginning to see how much of our environment or our epigenetics plays a role. And again, just coming from my training program, that's not necessarily things that I was taught in my own schooling. So what makes you say, um, thank God I, I wasn't trained as a, as a traditional psychiatrist. And can you share a little bit about kind of your shift in understanding, which is really transformational? Well, first of all, what we both share, I can see already, is that the way we were trained and the way we then learned how to think are two distinct things. So that uh, many of the things I had to learn, my training helped me to to learn, but I had to really turn my back on a lot of the essential ideological foundations of my training in order to understand what I've come to understand. Had I trained as a psychiatrist these days, for the most part, I would have trained in manipulating people's brain biology by means of medication. But the average psychiatrist, and I don't speak for everyone, I'm talking in general, because I speak with a lot of psychiatrists, I, I lecture to them. Um, the average psychiatrist is not grounded in understanding people's life experience from conception onwards in its multi-generational context about how the stresses and traumas of our parents and families and society bear upon the development of the human brain and the human personality. They tend to reduce things to what's called biological psychiatry, which is the manipulation mm-hmm. of the brain's physiology through the dispensation of medication, dispensing of medications, which sometimes can be helpful, of course, but it never deals with the fundamental source of things. It just deals with symptoms. So I'm very glad I wasn't trained in psychiatry. Mm-hmm. Instead, I worked as a family practitioner, which allowed me to see diseases of all kinds in the context of people's lives. And I learned how much of physical illness, whether it's autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or colitis, chronic fatigue, or what they call mental illness, depression, anxiety, psychosis, ADHD, and so on. These weren't genetically determined physiological entities. They were results of life experience in the context of a certain culture, of a certain family. So in other words, what you refer to as the biopsychosocial nature of human beings, which is not my original formulation, but I've come to firmly embrace it. It just means that our biology is inseparable from our emotions and from our social relationships, and therefore from the culture that we live in. In other words, it's all one, isn't it? It's all one. Absolutely. And you know, very much in alignment with 
one frustration that I kept coming up against when I was trying to separate right this mind from this rest of this being in my in my old practice and the frustration that I kept coming up against is the inability to change um, when we work in that way when we don't honor um, the impact of that oneness but also something you're talking about here which I very much believe in which is exploring right the underlying causes I mean even hearing you say things like depression and anxiety and very much in alignment with the way I, way I believe those are symptoms right of something deeper so let's begin to kind of unpack right where those deeper, um, dysfunctions or environments uh, originate because you're speaking to, I think, so many of us who have coming to the awareness, oftentimes in a period of incredible suffering, of oh. how intergenerational, in other words, you use these patterns are, of how so many of us can see the same habits, the same struggles, maybe even the same illnesses in these family lineages. So why is that? Why are they so similar? Um, and where, you know, when you do talk about these early environments, where are we locating the beginning, I guess, of this stress point? Well, I've heard you talk about the ruts that people live in. I think that's the word you use. And those ruts are developed early in life. <clears throat> and now, by the way, as a physician, I'm not against medication. I've taken them myself and they help me, you know. So this is not a rant against, <laughs> yeah. uh, not a total rant against medication. <laughs> But if you take something like depression, the word itself is a giveaway. What does it mean to depress something? It literally means to push it down. Now, what gets pushed down in depression? Our emotions and our feelings. Now, why would somebody do that? Have you ever met a one-day-old baby that that pushes down their feelings? You know, oh, um, I'm really uncomfortable and hungry and wet, but mommy and daddy are so busy, I mustn't bother them, you know? Like, no, we are born expressing and experiencing all our emotions. And experiencing our emotions an essential, is an essential need for human development, actually, for all kinds of reasons. Now, however, in some family environments, it's not acceptable to experience all your emotions because the parents, because of their own trauma or their own stress, or their own depression, are disturbed by the child's anger or the child's sadness to the child's grief so the child gets the message in order to be accepted in this environment i better push down these feelings that's not a conscious decision on the part of the child that's a defensive adaptive survival mechanism on the part of the child's organism so it's not conscious so the child's then the child's mind then pushes down these feelings and then 30 years later he she they are diagnosed with this disease called depression which began as a pure coping mechanism. Mm. And so um, it's really that straightforward. And the other point, of, it, of course, is that life experience affects the biology of the brain. So even if something as biological correlates in the brain, it doesn't mean that th that biology is genetically determined. Because the biology itself, given that we're biopsychosocial creatures, the biology itself reflects life experience. I think this is where some of us um, can get caught in that chicken or the egg. You know, those of us who are interested in the science and the neuroscience and have seen the studies of the actual <clears throat> structural changes, right, and what's coming to mind in the ADHD brain or in the autistic brain or in the OCD brain, um, we see, right, the impact visually. Um, and I think you're speaking very beautifully to that point, which is that that is, you know, an actual visual organic structural reorganization but again where did it come from did it come from this old belief that it's in, embodied in my genetics and i can't change it so it was just a ticking time bomb or did it come from the interaction of these genetics that you know i i can't necessarily control and then all of these different environments beginning in utero and i think that's again where we can spin ourselves and really differentiate yes structural changes happen and then they make it harder yeah. to become unstuck. However, thankfully, we know that the brain, the body is capable of change. It's neuroplastic throughout life. Um, but ultimately, I think that's an important piece to talk about, which is that absolutely our body does change, our brain does change. Um, but it's not, again, it's not a biological thing we were born with or an inherent, implicit, unchangeable structure now. Well, here's the thing. Here's the, that may be surprising to some of your listeners because of all the genetic propaganda that we're inundated, inundated with. 
Nobody has ever found a single gene for any mental health condition. Right. That if you have this gene, you're going to have this condition. Nobody's ever found that if you don't have this gene, you're not going to have this condition. Nobody's ever found, well, we're talking about 99%. I mean, there's a gene for Huntington's Korea. If you get the gene, you'll probably get the disease. There's a disease that runs in my family, muscular dystrophy. Mm -hmm. If you have, my mother had it. If you have the gene, you'll get the disease. Those are exceedingly rare. But in terms of the 99% of, 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 of mental health diagnoses, there's not a single gene that if you have it, you'll have the disease, or if you won't have it, you won't. There's no group of genes that if you have it, you'll have a certain disease. There's no group of genes that if you don't have it, you won't have the disease. What they seem to have found is a large um, group of, disparate group of genes that the more of them you have, the more likely you have to have any number of mental health conditions from psychosis to ADHD. But they don't code for either ADHD or psychosis or depression or anything else. What do they code for? They code for something. They don't code for disease. They code for sensitivity. The more sensitive you are, the more you're going to react to your environment. So you can be born with the same genes. And if you have a wonderful nurturing environment, you'll be just a creative joyful, um, insightful, intuitive, plugged in, connected leader. That's what we find. But if th those same, sen same sensitivity genes meet a difficult or pain inducing environment, the pain will be that much greater. Therefore, the adaptations to pain, like the depression or the tuning out or the splitting of the personality will be that much greater as well. So what we're inheriting is not diseases, but sensitivity. And that's a spectrum. But the more sensitive you are, the more likely you are to be, number one, creative, but also the more likely you are to have some kind of mental health condition because you have that much more pain to run away from. So that's the only thing that's being inherited here, not diseases. I really appreciate um, you kind of expanding on that and, and clarifying that and bringing up even um, us the study, the major, majorly funded study of trying to even map into our genome, right? I think yeah. that's what you're referencing. Like, where are these markers? And overwhelmingly, you know, like you're sharing, they're, they're not there um, and really explaining it. I think it's beautiful to be able to honor where we each land individually on that sensitivity scale um, right. and honoring that in interaction then with our earliest environments, which brings me to a concept that you bring up. Um, as we're beginning to explore, right, these adaptations that we make in this environment and leading us into really beginning to unpack this idea of the normal, right, and what what that even is and these changes that physiologically and emotionally so many of us have adapted. But you yeah. bring up um, an initial kind of conflict. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about that conflict because we in the community talk and explore a lot about our relationships and our earliest attachments and how they impact us through life and you bring up the conflict between attachment and authenticity. Um, can you share a little bit about kind of what you mean with that conflict and how that plays into this conversation around environments and adaptations? And like you were sharing earlier, how free and safe is it to express my feelings in, in any one um, environment or how free and unsafe or how not safe is it? Well, in bringing up the tension between attachment and authenticity, you're touching upon not only what is the chapter in the book of myth and normal, it's also a central theme that runs theme that runs through the book. And uh, it's crucial because mm -hmm. as mammalian creatures, we're actually dependent on our attachment relationships. Our attachment relationships are the ones that hold us safe and nurture us and provide the ground for our development. That's true not only for human beings, it's true for all mammals, it's even true for birds. No small creature, avian or mammalian, survives without that attachment relationship. Now, in the case of humans, our attachment needs are longer and deeper than that of any other creature because we're the least mature, the least developed, and stay that way the longest of all mammals. So that, that attachment relationship is a non-negotiable need without which our lives are uns unsustainable. In the case of humans, and not only in the case of humans, do you know what happens when a baby elephant is born? When, is a, when a mother elephant goes into labor, all the other mothers stand around in a circle. 
And when the infant hits the ground, all the mothers stroke them with their trunks. So the first thing that the baby receives is, is the loving touch of all these mothers. Mm -hmm. That's an elephant. Now, human beings, we're wired for the same kind of loving attachment. Attachment is not simply physical need. It's also an emotional need for healthy development. So that's clear. But we have another need, which is what I call authenticity. And that comes from the word auto for self. Like an automobile is a self-propelled mobile. Uh, and that's not a luxury. It's also need, another need because authenticity means the capacity to experience all our emotions and feelings. Now, let's not forget where we evolved. We did not evolve in cities. We evolved out in nature. How long does any creature survive if they're not in touch with their gut feelings? Not very long. <laughs> not very long. So now we have these two needs, attachment and authenticity. Ideally, the two are compatible and they, and they manifest together. But what happens in a family or in this culture where having one's genuine emotions threatens your attachment relationships? What if your parents grew up in racial-like homes and they're afraid of anger? So they're afraid of yours as a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. But what if they listen to the advice of any number of stupid parenting experts that, and I, I use the word stupid very advisedly, who tell you that an angry child should be made to sit by themselves till they get over it? Now, what message does the child get? The parents say, good little kids don't get angry. The child hears, angry little kids don't get loved. Right. So if I, if I have my full emotions, my full authenticity, my attachment relationships are threatened. Now, what's going to get sacrificed every time is the authenticity. So people surrender their authenticity very early in life in order to fit in with their culture and their families. And they lose, thereby, they lose connection with themselves, which is the essence of trauma. So this is without abuse. This is without terrible things happening. Just the ordinary family who tries to fit in in this culture and socialize their kids to be nice. Mm -hmm. And that means that we're almost forcing kids out of their authenticity, which then leads to all manner of physical and mental illness. Because we're biopsychosocial creatures, what happens emotionally will show up event, uh, physiologically as well. For example, right, just to get a simple example, have you ever experienced anger, Nicole? Absolutely. Okay, now, anger isn't just a thought in your head, is it? Oh, absolutely okay. not. <laughs> What's your physiological experience of anger? Um, for me, I sometimes even see my feel my wrists and my hands clenched. Yeah. Uh, my blood starts to race. Um, depending on how angry I am, my face might get red and I might even start to raise my voice or yell. All kinds of tension. For being in, honest, yes, lots of all tension. Kinds of chest and your tension yes. in your right. Now, how much energy would it take for you not to feel those things? Can you imagine? To not feel those things. Oh my gosh, it would add just as much energy on the other side of what I'm feeling, right? To suppress it, I'd imagine. So the suppression of emotion isn't just an emotional um, abstract dynamic. It actually has a huge impact on the body. Well, of course, it leads to disease. That energy that you're expanding not to feel what's in there. But so many kids are put into that position. Mm -hmm. So no wonder there's a huge link between the repression of anger, the loss of authenticity, and depression, and ADHD, and psychosis, and autoimmune disease like cancer, like, like, like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, scleroderma, chronic fatigue, and so on and so on. You know, so that because of the mind-body unity, when there's that much repression happening physiologically or emotionally, it plays out in our disconnection from our very bodies. And, the, the, and I'm sure that the healing work that you do in fact, I know that the thing that you are going to do is not just sort of talking about emotions, it's to reconnect people with their bodies. Yeah. And that actually, um, Gabor, grew out of me coming to realize somewhere in my 30s um, how disconnected, how dissociated, I used to call it living on my spaceship um, yeah. because of having an unsupportive home raised by two depression hour parents who were actually taught, weren't taught, I should say, that humans even have those needs of connectedness that you're beautifully describing. Um, some of us generationally 
um, especially if we've, I know, you know, part of your history coming from war torn areas, right? When survival is what we're taught is the priority, emotions get pushed to the back burner. And so it took me three decades to realize how disconnected um, from all of those intense emotions, anger being a predominant one for me, all living in my body that I was described actually by others as being nothing bothers Nicole aloof, right? And I think that really describes um, that state of disconnection. And I think this next question is a, a big one, though mm -hmm. I think it's important um, to begin to explore. I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what aspects of you know society are are challenging, right? Because we have our home environments, and of course, all of the beliefs and conditioning and trauma that our parents bring bring into our our worlds and the safety or lack of safety that we have. Um, but I know one of the big themes throughout the book is you know this idea of normal and fitting in with society and really beginning to call into question of how normal society is. So when you think about what aspects of you know early childhood development and and society, which ones come to mind are the most problematic or do send those similar messages of suppression that you're describing here? My response is which, which aspects of society are not. <laughs> Love that answer. <laughs> Let's begin with conception. Mm -hmm. So we now know that stress have an impact on the uh, physiological and the emotional development of the child because stress isn't an abstract entity it, it it's associated with the release of stress hormones that affects the brain development of the child in the womb now if any women are listening to this program who've ever been pregnant when you went to see the doctor for your first prenatal visit did anybody ask you about your emotions how your relationship was, you know, what traumas you're carrying from childhood, all of which are already impacting your you and your infant. Yesterday, just yesterday, I got an email from somebody who's a, a very well-known stunt person in uh, Hollywood, and she's written a book that will be published next year. Um, <clears throat> but she did a journey with the mushrooms, and she got in touch with, the pain she felt as an infant in utero because of her mother's stresses. I've heard similar stories from others. So let's begin with the prenatal care, which doesn't exist for the emotions and for all the stresses that pregnant women in this society because of stress, poverty, racism, insecu economic insecurity, uh, relational insecurity, isolation are, 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 are experiencing. That's prenatally. Then we can talk about birth. Birth is fundamentally a process not only to get the baby out of the womb, but also to help the infant bond with the mother. Physiologically, through a release of love cocktail hormones, we call them. In modern society, we have the wonderful achievements of modern obstetrics that are genuinely life-saving for infant and mother, a small percentage of the time. Well, we've mechanized birth to the extent that most women birth experience is actually an interference with the natural process. Mm -hmm. We've medicalized the natural process. So birth is a significant factor already on interfering with the mother-infant bond in many cases. Then there's the fact that in, in the United States, which calls itself the richest country in the world, and in terms of total wealth, it's true, 25% of women have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth, which is an abandonment of the infant. Not that the mothers intend to abandon their infants, but that's what the infants experience. You tell a mother baboon to ignore their infants at two weeks, or a mother bear, or a mother cat, you know? Then there is the way parents are taught to raise children in a stressed and isolated environment. We grew up as communal creatures in hunter-gatherer bands with lots of other parents around and uncles and aunts and cousins and you know, now it's all isolated and stressed. And we already talked about all the <clears throat> retrograde parenting advice that is dished out by the experts. Then 
there's the separation of children from their parents at an early age so the parents can go back to work at any age the fact that we evolved as creatures who spent all our time around the adults now we spend much of our time away from the nurturing adults then there's the nature of education itself whose fundamental mandate is not to raise independently really thinking in touch with themselves emotionally intelligent human beings but but kids who fit in like co like cookies into a cookie cutter right. matrix that we, you know they learn the same things at the same time come up with you know and these kids that are sensitive and troubled they're the troublemakers who get suppressed <clears throat> i could go on you know but i'm saying we get it wrong right from the beginning yes then there's the culture that doesn't meet our real needs for meaning connection belonging contact with nature um, <clears throat> um generosity and so on not meeting our needs we develop pseudo needs where we try and fill the emptiness that develops through products so that first of all the culture deprives us of our real needs so so develop these pseudo needs then they sell us all these products that temporarily fill the emptiness but only temporarily so that tomorrow we have to go and buy another one so that it's a perfect system and it creates these denies our real needs creates these pseudo needs and then meets them with all the products that they manufacture i could go on but maybe i've said enough no, I, I really appreciate you touching um, all of these different areas and really highlighting how early, right, this yeah. mismatch, for lack of a better word, between these individual and our needs and our uniqueness, our individuality, and this very cookie cutter, one size fits all um, indoctrinated model of, of society. And I, I think this brings us beautifully into, um, I'm interested to begin now to speak as someone who identifies as kind of someone who has one of my coping mechanisms from that very unattuned, emotionally abandoned childhood experience that I had was, I think, a very similar one that many of us shift into, which is, all right, well, I'm just going to achieve. I'm going to make sure, right, that I'm the perfectionist, the endlessly achiever. I will win my family, my mom in particular's love and that connectedness by her validation. And yeah. I kept that habit. And I'm bringing this up because I think culturally, this is one of those areas that even into adulthood, oftentimes, especially here in the States, gets celebrated, right? Yeah. This hustle culture, this, you know, the more letters you have after your name, the better. Um, you talk about the hyper functioning and people pleasing kind of archetype person. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested in kind of exploring a little bit about your thoughts on, on that manifestation and how that kind of fits in again and connects with this idea of authenticity or because I know, again, leading into this question from my own lived experience, I checked so many boxes of that endless achievement, you know, those milestones I set for myself to obtain this love. And you beautifully are describing it. It was as if this this hole, no matter how much I put stuff in, was still there. It was endless. And yeah. it was almost indescribable because, again, that trauma for me, that psychic wounding happened before I even had the words to describe it. But like you're saying endless consuming, right? And we never actually feel better to really simplify it. And I think that sometimes is that presentation of endless achieving, hyper-functioning, people-pleasing. So wondering what your thoughts are on, on kind of that as an adaptation and in that, how that fits into society and often is validated. Well, absolutely. So I'll give you uh, two examples, okay? Uh, one is myself. So the first chapter opens with my mother giving me to a total stranger in, in the street of Budapest in late 1944. That was her attempt to save my life, which would not have survived had she not done that. But so I didn't see her for weeks. That was to save my life. It was an act of love on the part of a 24 year old young woman. But how did the, how did the 11 month old me experience it as an abandonment? And the message is, I'm not wanted because I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy of being wanted. Now, if you're not wanted, one beautiful way of coping, if you believe you're not lovable and worthy enough, one beautiful way to deal with it is to go to medical school. 
because now they're going to want you all the time. As I've often said, when they're dying, when they're being born, and every moment in between. But it's never enough, because it doesn't matter how often the beeper goes and how important you're made to feel in a moment. There's still a doubt in you. Do they want me, or do they want what I'm doing for them? So that hole never gets filled. So it becomes totally addictive. Now, the world rewards me for it. Oh, that wonderful, you know, my wife would go into a supermarket or a bank and somebody would look at the credit card and say, oh, are you the wife of, and she would say, yeah, oh, isn't he wonderful? And she would grit her teeth because the wonderful Dr. Mate who was available for the whole world to fulfill his drive to be wanted was not available to his own family. So what message do my kids get? Same one that I got. Not because I intended it that way. That's the first point. The second point comes from my chapter on politics, and it's a very famous example, but it's not really understood. It's like, what would you say about some four year old girl as a psychologist? Uh, if a four year old girl is being bullied in the neighborhood and runs into the house to seek protection from the mother, and the mother says, There's no room for cards in this house. Now you get out and deal with it. How would you see that? I would feel for for the child who, you know, likely felt invalidated and largely unsupportive in that moment, unsupported. And traumatized. Mm -hmm. Well, this story was told on public television as a wonderful example of parenting. Uh -huh. When Hillary Clinton was nominated for the presidency of the United States, and uh, th she said, this is what taught me toughness and resilience, which is celebrated, isn't it? Just like my workaholism was celebrated and remunerated. 55 years later or 60 years later, she gets pneumonia during the election campaign. You remember what she did with that? She hid it because she collapsed. She got dehydrated and she collapsed in the street. Mm -hmm. A secret serviceman had to carry her into the van. And this is a wonderful, so this, this, this traumatization of this four-year-old was celebrated on public television as a beautiful example of resilience building. So this society celebrates that, suppress myself, keep going, no matter what, ethic. And yet it's so wounding to the soul. And then the people who succeed in making it work for them are the successful ones that we're supposed to look up to. I don't want anybody to look up to me for being a workaholic doctor. I want them to see the human being that paid a heavy price for that, both in terms of his own mental health and also in terms of the health of his own family. Mm -hmm. right. And I think it's, it's that toll, um, giving words to it, speaking about it, honoring it, um, allowing it to be part of part of the journey for each of us is is so incredibly important yeah. um, because it does you know live within us like like you you know formulate trauma it's a, it's a wounding we carry it with us it doesn't go anywhere um, and there's so many of us that haven't had that emotional right space and again I'm just sharing this from from my journey and I had a habit myself of invalidating of looking at people who I imagined had it worse or who I was you know verbally acknowledged had it worse in whatever way and minimizing um, because I had a parent physically present and I had meals on my table and there wasn't financial insecurity um, around losing my home. And then we tend to, I think, minimize the other stressful experiences that we've had or the other inability to be that authentic self and how that continues then to impact us into, into adulthood. And I think really giving live words to it and you said this, and um, you've spoken this this statement in a, a different interview that I, I heard. But I think what what is important um, for a lot of us when I'm even talking about acknowledging it, um, so many of us don't like I didn't at one time have the words. We might not exactly know what happened or have the words to even maybe describe how we feel about what happened at such a young age, because when the event or events occurred, right, we were preverbal. We actually didn't have language to cognitively make sense of it in our in our minds or to you know verbally communicate that to others and 
you speak of um, nonverbal, you know, attachment patterns. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about here, these adaptations and how they continue to drive us as in these people pleasing functions. And you said this one beautiful sentence, I just want to verbalize it here. Um, Cause I think it really captures this idea of when wounding happens and we don't have the words, it doesn't mean that it didn't exist. It's still very valid. And you said long before you're talking about a, a gentleman, a, a he, long before he had those ideas. So anyway, long before we have any idea, we could say we've had those emotions. Yeah. And I think that's just such a beautiful way to describe right this early, early part of our journey. Because again, speaking from my experience, I don't have those memories. I, I, oftentimes can't verbally put into words what that initial feeling of loneliness was like in childhood when I didn't have that emotionally attuned mother. And having spoken about it so consistently, I know that so so much of my community of self-healers resonates with that. They don't have, their wounding happened um, at that nonverbal time. So I'm um, interested in just kind of hearing a little bit about you know this, this nonverbal world and um, how that does continue to still impact us. And ultimately then shifting the conversation a bit into what to do now, right? How do we begin to heal um, if we do come into the awareness that we are carrying some of our history with us into our present moment? Well, so thanks. Um, before I answer the pre-verbal question, let me address something that you said, um, which is that uh, you told yourself that other people had it worse. Okay, so let me ask you this question: If I saw you're a psychologist, if somebody comes to you and says, "I had such and such difficult things happening and painful events," would you say? Have you ever said to your client, "What are you whining about?" There's so many people with worse experiences than you. Have you ever said that to anybody? I know, have not personally. Right. <laughs> no. no, I yeah. Or if a four year old comes to you and says, uh, you know, uh, I'm having such and such, I'm angry, I'm sad, and so on. Would you say to them, what are you whining about? At least you have parents. Would you say that no. to a four-year-old? No. So, so notice the double standard, the way we talk to ourselves and the way, we, you know, we have lack of, lack of self-compassion, which is what that exhibits, is one of the impacts of trauma. Yes. So that's the first point, okay? And so a lot of what I try to do in this book is to help people evoke, help people have you help evoke people's self compassion through self understanding. That's the first point. Now, in terms of no memory, I will quibble with your language because you said you don't remember. I say you do remember. You just don't recall. Yes. And there's a distinction. Recall is the verbal capacity to call back. Recall. But remembering happens not just on a verbal level. It happens on a nonverbal level, on an emotional level. So that every time, um, I do this exercise quite frequently with people, tell me the last time you're upset with somebody. In, all those, in the course of miracles, it says that you're never angry about what you're angry about. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. that's I totally agree with that. I mean, that's true about 99% of the time. So much of the time we get upset, so-called triggered, in adult life, that's a memory of uh, that's a childhood emotional memory without the recall. So there's the two kinds of memory, which is the verbal recall memory, which doesn't begin to come online till three, age three or so. Then there is the memory of the emotions that is already there in utero and is embedded in the nervous system and it shows up in our lives. So if you don't think you remember, just look at when you get upset or triggered. That's your memory right there. That, and there's ways of working with that. There's actually ways of getting people to recognize their memory patterns without the recall. And I do that all the time. Um, thirdly, when it comes to healing, well, it, it we can begin the conversation by saying that just recognizing what's going on. Like, for example, I mean, in the first chapter, again, I, I begin with this example of me arriving back from a speaking trip and getting enraged because my wife is not there to pick me up. What's that about? For God's sakes, I was 71 years old. I can't handle taking a taxi home. I can't handle the knowledge that my wife, being an artist, she was in her studio, and as always, artists always do when they're painting, they forget that anything else <laughs> even exists. You know, I've only known that for half a century. So what was my rage and hurt all about? 
a sense of abandonment, a sense of rejection, a sense of rage about that. That wasn't a recall. That was a preverbal memory of being given to a stranger by my mother. So that's what showed up there. But well, if once I no, if I recognize that, oh, this is what I would have felt as a one-year-old. But I'm not a one-year-old anymore. Actually, I'm 71. <laughs> so the, the, just the recognition of that is is the first step towards healing. Yeah, I really appreciate, um, Gibber, you're making that distinction um, for me and for all the listeners between memory, remembering, and recall. Um, and because I... Yeah, I'm sorry to jump in. But the other aspect of it is that when a child is overwhelmed with emotion, they're also overwhelmed with cortisol. Their brain is overwhelmed with cortisol. And when they're overwhelmed with cortisol, the memory functions, the recall functions in the brain go offline. So that very often, just when something is happening that's very significant, the part of the brain that is supposed to encode it actually goes offline. So that the memory is not only preverbal, it's also nonverbal. Very often. Right. And I think in addition to the shame that I think a lot of us adults feel when we behave, as I'll very bluntly say, immaturely, right? And I'll just say it myself, when I'm yelling and screaming after the fact, or I'm icing and, you know, storming away in yeah. that very, you know, immature, best attempt that I once had at managing those emotions, we feel, you know, shameful about it. Um, I think that's important to understand that that is so alive for us because that memory is embodied um, in that moment. And oftentimes yeah. we don't even, we lose access to that very logical, eloquent, even the ability to show up in, in another way. And, you know, in the community, we often speak about and take this as a moment to really highlight and emphasize, um, especially as we're beginning to speak about, you know, coming to this reality of these embodied adaptations that live in us, which might be dysregulation in my actual body and my nervous system. Maybe, you know, I am someone whose cortisol and my stress system is all out of whack, again, because of these earliest adaptations. So for me, this is what has inspired me um, and why you've been such an inspiration on my professional journey um, at no longer just working from the mind is that in that very separate approach. I mean, even a theme that's run through this conversation is how interconnected we are as beings. There is no separate human, even if our lives have been, you know, because of society and the forced separation and immediately at birth, we're separate from our mother, right? At least for a, a moment of time. Um, and how all of these different systems and beliefs have continued to separate as opposed to ultimately connect us. And you talk about, you know, the beginnings of a journey and I think what you're sharing here ultimately and very much in alignment with language I use, which is just becoming aware, conscious of these patterns of what, how maybe society is continuing to impact. And obviously something that comes to mind, I have my phone right here, who doesn't walk around with one of these, talk about another environment, right? That we could be cycling in, stressing ourselves out with um, day in and day out. So to really honor um, this, the journey, which might mean for many of you listening to talks um, like from yourself, like this conversation here today, and maybe just, you know, getting curious of what is present, what might be non-verbally stored in my body's memory that I might be repeating, right, in my in my daily journey, maybe even without the language um, to well, describe um, it. I have to smile when you use the word immature, because we can use that word two ways. As a judgment, right. but also as a very accurate description. Right, yes. Like, would you ever say to a one-day a one day old baby, don't be so immature, <laughs> grow up already? Or to a one-year-old, don't be such a baby, you know? And But that's the whole point. That's the part of it that's showing up. So let's not shame ourselves any more than we would shame the one-day-old or the one-year-old. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, it reminds me of a Saturday Night Life skit about 40 years ago. These two guys, these two guys are in college, and they're in the, call, in the, they're in the hall of the university, and they're wearing diapers and they're sucking baby bottles, but they're adult size. And these other people come up to them and say, Oh, what are you, a baby? <laughs> and they say, Yeah, you know what? Actually, I'm a baby. And then, uh, is that your diaper? Yeah, that's my diaper, which keeps me from soiling my, my clothing. And is that baby? Are you sucking a, a, a baby bottle? Yeah, I'm sucking a baby bottle. 
you know, it's, 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 we all have those immature parts. Yep. And, and when they show up, we need to treat them, right. not to indulge them, but to treat them with the same compassion that we would a real baby, a really immature human being, because that's what's showing up. And the reason we stayed immature is not a character fault. It's because the conditions of our development were not there to support our maturation. In that sense, we have to reparent ourselves or to allow others to reparent us, which is really what good therapy is about, isn't it? And then beautifully, this all comes full circle, right? Those of us who have trauma struggle. We're critical. We're non-compassionate. You speak in your book about a process of compassionate inquiry and right how getting curious in a non-judgmental and compassionate way can be the embodiment of exactly what we're talking about here. But again, beautifully tying this full circle, right? If yeah. all of us out there, and there I'm sure are so many that are going to be listening to this podcast that have that unsatiable hole, right? That deep sense of loneliness, um, all of those adaptations and patterns, right, that we're kind of cycling around with every day, trying to kind of get these needs met. Now we're interacting in a society that is very far, right, from our normal evolutionary society that we grew up in, making more adaptations to try and right manage the stress, um, essentially, of being human. And some of us falling into that little niche and getting validated and validated and validated, yet again, underneath of us, um, yeah. There is a part, and I think that's why um, work like yours, like mine, is 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 so impactful and now becoming so so known. Um, it's because I think society now is at a, a critical place um, of these adaptations and are beginning to become or utilize maybe even the process of compassionate inquiry in a sense, right? Starting to get curious of of why we're all struggling in the ways that we are. Exactly. Um, what is this myth of normal? Um, are we trying to fit ourselves into environments, you know, that aren't as supportive? And ultimately, through that process of inquiry, can we get curious? Can we create, like you're saying, ways to be more supported, ways to be more safe in our authentic expression? Um, and I am so ever inspired um, by people like yourself who are speaking um, this in such a way that is so understandable. Um, something I say often, having read a million books of different natures, there's a difference between reading someone whose work is like, oh, I, I get this. This isn't just a, a concept written in big words that sound you know, important. This is written in a way that I understand how this looks in my daily life. And you wholeheartedly um, offer that to your readers and people who follow your work, myself included. So Thank you for giving um, us that translation and that roadmap and really beginning to, in my opinion, transform um, the whole field of, of medicine and, and of healing. And I am ever, ever hopeful, um, Gabor, for the future, um, seeing people like you and the impact that you have. And again, I'm, I'm just so, so honored for well, how I, you show up and what you, what you give to the collective. Well, Nicole, I can just mirror that because... Um... Quite far from your personality or my personality, what does it mean that you have all these people in your community that are following you? What does it mean that my books are translated into 30 languages and that people listen to me? It means that people are beginning to wake up. Yes. Why are they beginning to wake up? Because the contradictions of the society are just making it impossible for a lot of people anymore to keep their eyes closed. So they start asking those questions. So I think beyond our personalities and our particular contributions there's just a general awakening that is that life is forcing upon us and uh i'm grateful to be a part of it as i'm sure you are and i'm very grateful for this opportunity uh, that you've given me